Line 230, A Domestic Ghost. Shade's former secretary, Jane Provost, whom I recently looked up in Chicago, Chicago, told me about Hazel considerably more than her father did. He affected not to speak of his dead daughter, and since I did not foresee this work of inquiry and comment, I did not urge him to talk on the subject and unburden himself to me. True, in this canto, he has unburdened himself pretty thoroughly, and his picture of Hazel is quite clear and complete. Maybe a little too complete, architectonically, since the reader cannot help feeling that it has been expanded and elaborated to the detriment of certain other richer and rarer matters ousted by it. But a commentator's obligations cannot be shirked, however dull the information he must collect and convey. Hence, this note. It appears that in the beginning of 1950, long before the barn accident, see note to line 347, 16-year-old Hazel was involved in some appalling psychokinetic manifestations that lasted for nearly a month. Initially, one gathers the poltergeist meant to impregnate the disturbance with the identity of Aunt Maud, who had just died. The first object to perform was the basket in which she had once kept her half-paralyzed Sky Terrier, the breed called in our country Weeping Willow Dog. Sybil had had the animal destroyed soon after its mistress's hospitalization, incurring the wrath of Hazel, who was beside herself with distress. One morning, this basket shot out of the, quote, intact, end of quote, sanctuary, see lines 90 to 98, and traveled along the corridor past the open door of the study where Shade was at work. He saw it whiz by and spill its humble contents, a ragged coverlet, a rubber bone, and a partly discolored cushion. Next day, the scene of action switched to the dining room where one of Aunt Maud's oils, Cypress and Bat, was found to be turned toward the wall. Other incidents followed, such as short flights accomplished by her scrapbook, see note to line 90, and of course all kinds of knockings, especially in the sanctuary, which would rouse Hazel from her no doubt peaceful sleep in the adjacent bedroom. But soon the poltergeist ran out of ideas in connection with Aunt Maud and became, as it were, more eclectic. All the banal motions that objects are limited to in such cases were gone through in this one. Saucepans crashed in the kitchen, a snowball was found, perhaps prematurely, in the icebox. Once or twice Sybil saw a plate sail by like a discus and land safely on the sofa. Lamps kept lighting up in various parts of the house, chairs waddled away to assemble in the impassable pantry. Mysterious bits of string were found on the floor. Invisible revelers staggered down the staircase in the middle of the night, and one winter morning shade, upon rising and taking a look at the weather, saw that the little table from his study, upon which he kept a Bible like Webster open at M, was standing in a state of shock outdoors on the snow. Subliminally, this may have participated in the making of lines 5 to 12. I imagine that during that period, the Shades, or at least John Shade, experienced a sensation of odd instability as if parts of the everyday, smoothly running world had got unscrewed and you became aware that one of your tires was rolling beside you or that your steering wheel had come off. My poor friend could not help recalling the dramatic fits of his early boyhood and wondering if this was not a new genetic variant of the same theme preserved through procreation. Trying to hide from neighbors these horrible and humiliating phenomena was not the least of Shade's worries. He was terrified, and he was lacerated with pity. Although never able to corner her, that flabby, feeble, clumsy, and solemn girl who seemed more interested than frightened, he and Sybil never doubted that in some extraordinary way she was the agent of the disturbance which they saw as representing, I now quote Jane P., quote, an outward extension or expulsion of insanity, end of quote. They could not do much about it, par partly because they disliked modern voodoo psychiatry, but mainly because they were afraid of Hazel and afraid to hurt her. They had, however, a secret interview with old-fashioned and learned Dr. Sutton, and this put them in better spirits. They were contemplating moving into another house, or more exactly, loudly saying to each other so as to be overheard by anyone who might be listening, that they were contemplating moving when all at once the fiend was gone, as happens with the Moscovet, that bitter blast, that colossus of cold air. It blows on our eastern shores throughout March, and then one morning you hear the birds, and the flags hang flaxen, and the outlines of the world are again in place. The phenomena ceased completely and were, if not forgotten, at least never referred to. But how curious it is that we do not perceive a mysterious sign of equation between the Hercules springing forth from a neurotic child's weak frame and the boisterous ghost of Aunt Maud. 
how curious that our rationality feels satisfied when we plump for the first ex ex explanation. Though actually the scientific and the supernatural, the miracle of the muscle and the miracle of the mind are both inexplicable, as are all the ways of our Lord. Line 231, how ludicrous, etc. A beautiful variant with one curious gap branch branches off at this point in the draft dated July 6th. Strange other world where all are stillborn dwell and pets revived and invalids grown well and minds that died before arriving there. Poor old man Swift, poor, poor Baudelaire. What might that dash stand for? Unless Shade gave prosodic value to the mute E in Baudelaire, which I am quite certain he would never have done in English verse. The name required here must scan as a troquet. Among the names of celebrated poets, painters, philosophers, etc., known to have become insane or to have sunk into senile imbecility, we find many suitable ones. Was Shade confronted by too much variety with nothing to help logic choose and so left a blank relying upon the mysterious organic force that rescues poets to fill it in at its own convenience? Or was there something else, some obscure intuition, some prophetic scruple that prevented him from spelling out the name of an eminent man who happened to be an intimate friend of his? Was he perhaps playing safe because a reader in his household might have objected to that particular name being mentioned? And if it comes to that, why mention it at all in this tragical context? Dark, disturbing thoughts. Line 238, empty emerald case. This, I understand, is the semi-transparent envelope left on a tree trunk by an adult cicada that has crawled up the trunk and emerged. Shade said that he had once questioned a class of 300 students and only three knew what a cicada looked like. Ignorant settlers had dubbed it locust, which is, of course, a grasshopper, and the same absurd mistake has been made by generations of translators of La Fontaine's La Segal et la Formi, see lines 243 to 244. The Segal is companion piece, the ant is about to be embalmed in amber. During our sunset rambles, of which there were so many, at least nine, according to my notes in June, but dwindling to two in the first three weeks of July, they shall be resumed elsewhere. My friend had a rather coquettish way of pointing out with the tip of his cane various curious natural objects. He never tired of illustrating by means of these examples the extraordinary blend of Canadian zone and Austral zone that, quote, obtained, end of quote, as he put it, in that particular spot of Appalachia where at our altitude of about 1,500 feet, northern species of birds, insects, and plants commingled with Southern representatives. As most literary celebrities, Shade did not seem to realize that a humble admirer who has cornered at last and has at last to himself the inaccessible man of genius is considerably more interested in discussing with him literature and life than in being told that the Diana, presumably a flower, occurs in New Y together with the Atlantis, presumably another flower, and things of that sort, I particularly remember one exasperating evening stroll, July 6th, which my poet granted me with a majestic generosity and compensation for a bad hurt, see, frequently see, note to line 181, in recompense for my small gift, which I do not think he ever used, and with the sanction of his wife, who made it a point to accompany us part of the way to Dulwich Forest. By means of astute excursions into natural history, Shade kept evading me, me, who was hysterically, intensely, uncontrollably uncontrollably curious to know what portion exactly of the Zimblin King's adventures he had completed in the course of the last four or five days. My usual shortcoming, pride, prevented me from pressing him with direct questions, but I kept reverting to my own earlier themes, the escape from the palace, the adventures in the mountains, in order to force some confession from him. One would imagine that a poet, in the course of composing a long and difficult piece, would simply jump at the opportunity of talking about his triumphs and tribulations, but nothing of the sort. All I got in reply to my infinitely gentle and cautious interrogations were such phrases as, yep, it's coming along nicely, or nope, I'm not talking. 
And finally, he brushed me off with a rather offensive anecdote about King Alfred, who it was said, like the stories of a Norwegian attendant he had, but drove away him, drove him away when engaged in other business. Oh, there you are, Rude Alfred would say to the gentle Norwegian who had come to weave a subtly different variant of some old Norse myth he had already related before. Oh, there you are again. And thus it came to pass, my dears, that a fabulous exile, a God-inspired northern bard, is known today to English schoolboys by the trivial nickname, Oh, there. However, on a later occasion, my capricious and hen-pecked friend was much kinder. See note to line 802. Line 240, that Englishman and niece. The seagulls of 1933 are all dead, of course, but by inserting a notice in the London Times, one might procure the name of their benefactor unless Shade invented him. When I visited Nice a quarter of a century later, there was, in lieu of that Englishman, a local character, an old bearded bum, tolerated or abetted as a tourist attraction, who stood like a statue of Verlaine with an unfastidious seagull perched in profile on his matted hair or took naps in the public sun, comfortably curled up with his back to the lulling roll of the sea on a promenade bench under which he had neatly arranged to dry, or ferment, multicolored goblets of undeterminable victuals on a newspaper. Not many Englishmen walked there anyway, though I noticed quite a few just east of Mentone, on the quay where, in honor of Queen Victoria, a bulky monument, with difficulty embraced by the breeze, had been erected but not yet unshrouded to replace the one the Germans had taken away. Rather pathetically, the eager horn of her pet monoceros protruded through the shroud. Line 246, my dear. The poet addresses his wife, the passage devoted to her, lines 246 to 292, has its structural use as a transition to the theme of his daughter. I can, however, state that when dear Sybil's steps were heard upstairs, fierce and sharp above our heads everything was not always quote all right end of quote line 247 sybil john shade's wife nay irondel which comes not from a little valley yielding iron ore but from the french for quote swallow end of quote she was a few months his senior i understand she came of canadian stock as did shade's maternal grandmother a first cousin of sybil's grandfather if I'm not greatly mistaken. From the very first, I tried to behave with the utmost courtesy toward my friend's wife, and from the very first, she disliked and distrusted me. I was to learn later that when alluding to me in public, she used to call me an elephantine, an elephantine tick, a king-sized botfly, a macaco worm, the monstrous parasite of a genius, end of quote. I pardon her, her and everybody. Line 270, my dark Vanessa. It is so like the heart of a scholar in search of a fond name to pile a butterfly genus upon an Orphic divinity on top of the inevitable allusion to Van Homrig, Esther. In this connection, a couple of lines from one of Swift's poems, which in these backwoods I cannot locate, have stuck in my memory. When lo, Vanessa in her bloom advanced like Atalanta's star. As to the Vanessa butterfly, it will appear in lines 993 to 995, to which see note, Shade used to say that its old English name was the Red Admirable, later degraded to the Red Admiral. It is one of the few butterflies I happen to be familiar with. Zemblins call it Harvalda, the heraldic one, possibly because a recognizable figure of it is born in the escutcheon of the Dukes of Pain. In the autumn of certain years, it used to occur rather commonly in the palace gardens and visit the Michael Mus daisies in company with a day flying moth. I have seen the Red Admirable feasting on oozy plums and once on a dead rabbit. It is a most frolicsome fly. An almost tame specimen of it was the last natural object John Shade pointed out to me as he walked to his doom. See, now, my note to lines 993 to 995.
I notice a whiff of swift in some of my notes. I too am a desponder in my nature and uneasy, peevish and suspicious man, although I have my moments of volatility and fourier. We have been married 40 years, line 275. John Shade and Sybil Swallow, see note to line 247. We're married in 1919, exactly three decades before King Charles wed Disa, Duchess of Pain. Since the very beginning of his reign, 1936 to 1958, representatives of the nation, salmon fishermen, non-union glaziers, military groups, worried relatives, and especially the Bishop of Yeslov, a sanguineous and saintly old man, had been doing their utmost to persuade him to give up his copious but sterile pleasures and take a wife. It was a matter not of morality, but of succession as in the case of some of his predecessors, rough alder kings who burned for boys, the clergy blandly ignored our young bachelor's pagan habits, but wanted him to do what an earlier and even more reluctant Charles had done, take a night off and lawfully engender an heir. He saw 19-year-old Dissa for the first time on the festive night of July the 5th, the 5th 1947. At a masked ball in his uncle's palace, she had come in male dress as a Tyrolese boy, a little knock-kneed but brave and lovely, and afterwards he drove her and her cousins, two guardsmen disguised as flower girls, in his divine new convertible through the streets to see the tremendous birthday illumination and the facultons in the park and the fireworks and the pale upturned faces. He procrastinated for almost two years, but was set upon by inhumanly eloquent advisors and finally gave in. On the eve of his wedding, he prayed most of the night, locked up all alone in the cold vastness of the Anhava Cathedral. Smug alder kings looked at him from the ruby and amethyst windows. Never had he so fervently asked God for guidance and strength. See further my note to lines 433 to 434. After line 274, there is a false start in the draft. I like my name. Shade. Hombre. Almost man in Spanish. One regrets that the poet did not pursue this theme and spare his reader the embarrassing intimacies that follow. 